Hello, welcome to part one out of two of my lecture on chapter five. It's all about cellular metabolism, how cells harness energy and also how they are able to control their internal environments um, using energy and through the plasma membrane or cell membrane. So cells need to do a lot of different activities or functions in order to sustain life or maintain homeostasis. Those things include movement, processing energy, and also producing various substances. Cells are able to control their chemical environments or internal environments using energy and enzymes, which are closely linked. And then also the plasma membrane helps cells to maintain homeostasis in their internal chemical environment. So part one of this lecture is gonna cover energy and enzymes. And then part two of the lecture will cover how the plasma membrane is involved in that and cell transport. Energy is defined as the capacity to cause change. And as you probably have learned in a physics or physical science class in the past, there are different forms of energy. And we're gonna talk about some of those. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Potential energy is stored energy that an object has because of its location or structure. The maintenance of life depends on all of the different conversions of energy between different forms. And this is a graphic from your book that shows the different energy transformations that occur during a dive. The principle known as conservation of energy explains that it's impossible to destroy or create energy, but that energy is converted from one form to another. And that's going to be important moving forward. Heat is a type of kinetic energy that's contained in the random motion of atoms or molecules. And every time there's a conversion of energy between different forms, a certain amount of heat is generated. Entropy is a concept that describes the fact that systems tend toward disorder or chaos. It's also a measure of the disorder or chaos or randomness within a system. So every time energy is converted from one form to another, ener entropy increases. And one way I like to describe entropy is that, you know, your house doesn't, doesn't clean itself. It takes a lot of energy to clean your house, depending on how messy of a person you are, or how many family members you have, but it takes relatively little energy to make a mess in the first place. Like during the week when you're really busy and you have school and work and you come home and you're tired and you have, you know, your clothes may go in the floor, you may empty your pockets onto the nightstand, you have books that you're using for school that are out, you know, on your desk or on your nightstand or wherever. And then when you get to the end of the week, before you know it, you've made a mess. Well, on Saturday is usually my cleaning day. Um, you look at your mess and it's hard to operate in that mess. So you decide you're going to clean it. And then it probably takes you several hours to clean your whole house. And so that is just, you know, systems like a household tend toward disorder. A house doesn't clean itself. Chemical energy is energy that is stored in molecules of food or gasoline and other fuels. And chemical energy is actually a specific type of potential energy that arises from the way that the atoms in a molecule are arranged. And the bonds between those atoms actually contain energy that can be released during chemical reactions. So the process that cells and car engines use to release the chemical energy that's stored in those bonds of the molecules of their fuels, that process that they use to release that energy is very, very similar. So that's what we're going to talk about in this figure from your book. On the top, you have a car. On the bottom, you have a cell. 
on the left hand side it shows that the fuel for um, cars is octane from gasoline and then you need oxygen in order for the process called combustion to happen and during combustion some heat energy is released and then kinetic energy is harnessed by the car's engine in order to um, make the car move and then you have the byproducts on the right hand side and those are carbon dioxide and water similarly down here in the cell you have glucose which is the fuel that comes from food and then you need oxygen in order for cellular respiration which is the process just like combustion in the car cellular respiration harnesses energy from glucose in order to um, be stored in a molecule called ATP that's used to carry out work in a cell to carry out the cell's metabolism and then some of that energy is lost as heat and then the byproducts are exactly the same as the byproducts of combustion CO2 and water so cellular respiration is something we're going to focus on a lot more in the next chapter but it is the process by which glucose is broken down to release energy to produce ATP, which is a form of energy that cells can very, very easily use in order to carry out all of their chemical reactions, move things in and out, to do anything that they need to do in order to maintain homeostasis in order to sustain life. One example of you know, uh, converting food energy into energy that's used for work is in humans, we convert about 34% of the energy that's stored in our food to useful work. The rest of the energy is released as heat and generates body heat, just like in the, in the figure before with the car and the cell, uh, the combustion and cellular respiration generate heat. Well, in humans, that goes to body heat. Calories are something that we usually think of as pesky things that we have to burn um, in order not to gain weight, but the actual scientific definition of a calorie is that it's the amount of energy that is needed in order to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. The calories in food are actually, actually kilocalories, and a kilocalorie is equal to 1,000 calories. The energy that is found in the calories of the food that we eat is used to fuel all of the activities that we need to carry out in our lives. I thought this figure from your book was pretty cool. It just shows the relative amounts of calories in different foods on the top. And then on the bottom, those shadow pictures of activities are arranged according to the amount of calories that they burn per 30 minutes of activity. Okay, so back to ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. Please know that. Um, ATP is a form of energy that cells can very easily use to power their activities or metabolism. Chemical energy that is released when the glucose from food molecules or organic molecules um, that's released during cellular respiration and is used to generate ATP. The way your book describes it is that ATP is like an energy shuttle. It stores the energy that is released from food or glucose and then releases it later when the cell needs to use it for something. This is a depiction of how that works. So ATP, you have an adenosine molecule attached to three phosphate molecules, hence triphosphate. These two bonds between the phosphate molecules have a lot of energy. They're very high energy bonds. And so when this third phosphate group is broken off from adenosine triphosphate, a lot of energy is released. And then you end up with the products adenosine diphosphate, and then you have this third phosphate group, which is transferred to another molecule. ATP energizes other molecules and cells when that third phosphate 
is transferred to another molecule. That energy helps cells to do different things like change shape, move ions and other materials in or out of the cell across the cell membrane. And it also is needed in order for the cell to produce its macromolecules or large molecules, such as proteins, carbohydrates, and fats or lipids. Okay, so these are different pictures showing how ATP drives cellular work. I'm not going to spend time on that, but you may look at them and see if they help you. Okay, so cells are continuously using ATP to power their activities. Um, whenever an ATP is used and that third phosphate group is broken off like I showed earlier, then the ATP is converted to ADP. ATP is recycled when a third phosphate group is put back onto it. And, and the way that that third phosphate group is put back onto ADP is using the energy released during cellular respiration. Up to 10 million ATP molecules can be consumed and recycled in a single second in a working muscle cell. Okay, I'm gonna stop part one there and I will cover enzymes and cell transport in part two of my lecture on chapter five. Thank you so much for listening.